And I recently learned about Robin Hanson when I caught some of his recent interview with Lex Fridman. And I also kind of jumped around and listened to some, there was a, a couple guys, Bad Christian, I think it's called. Right, right. And he did a, a year ago, he did a thing on UFO right. God and aliens. And so officially speaking, the way it's presented, Robin Hansen is Associate Professor of Economics at George Mason University and Research Associate at the Future of Humanity Institute of Oxford University. He has a doctorate in social science from California Institute of Technology, master's degrees in physics and philosophy from the University of Chicago, and nine years experience as a research programmer at Lockheed and NASA. So uh, I also want to add that Robin has written and spoken about many different subjects other than UFOs and aliens, quite obviously, with a background like that, I'm sure he hasn't made uh, the sum and substance of his work about UFOs and aliens. So what I'm going to do here, I, I've made a bunch of notes. I'll be jumping back and forth uh, with questions and comments and, and things. But my, my purpose is really twofold here. It's to fil familiarize my audience with Robin and his work and to familiarize Robin with the work I'm involved in just before I rolled the official intro here I was about to right you know talk about that I thought well I'm going to wait on that a little bit because I get exactly. the chance to do that all the time and I'm loaded for bear but I want to know okay you so we're two people who I think share a common interest one you know one overlapping interest we approach it in two very different ways to find the true facts, I'll put it that way. So, uh, because words like truth, I know in science, people don't always like it. And facts is pretty acceptable. So true facts, we might go there. So I have a premise that I like to operate from, and I'm gonna see how you take to it. And I state it like this, the confirmed existence of and contact with space traveling extraterrestrial life forms would be the most important development in all of science and human history. So let me just toss that out to you and modify, correct, change, add your own point of view to that. Well, uh, I mean, the question is how important is it exactly to rank the top 20? <laughs> I mean, I'm happy to grant that it's pretty important and therefore will we'll overwhelm other things. Whether it's exactly number one or number 20, it hardly matters, really. Uh, let, let's put it up there at the top. It's certainly big and important. It's important. OK, we can we can agree on that. And um, one of the things is it's interesting that you are associated with the Future of Humanity Institute. I had a radio show called uh, the Future of Humankind. We There's a website called Future of Mankind. I've written a book called Future Self. There's uh, This future thing is something that's, from what I gathered, also, uh, you know, quite present in your, uh, in the context of what you present, what you talk about, what you're interested in. And so I made a couple notes here about some possibilities I think we may have some overlap on. And I noticed one place you spoke about government dis disinfo and ufology and how. So f feel free, please expound and I will listen. Um, give me a bigger clue there to what, what, what are sure. we talking about? Great, absolutely. Uh, I saw in one of, one of the articles, I think it was that you had, you uh, did not rule out the fact that the government may uh, know more than it says, or it may conceal things. There may be things it doesn't know much about, but still uh, presents, but it's not the, the most reliable source for public uh, factual information about the topic, something like that. So let's just start at the beginning. Uh, I have a, a research agenda on aliens in general, like where they would be in space time, that is other advanced civilization like ourselves. And then as somewhat of a sideline, I talked a bit about what that might imply for UFOs. Uh, so I haven't so much published on that, but I've published on aliens. Um, but it's an interesting and, and worthy topic to examine. So if we uh, ask about UFO reports, that is the things people said they've seen, seen and experienced, if we ask about categories of explanation, what are the main categories you might invoke? Uh, you know, I usually think of four rough categories. One would be 
just mistakes, errors, misunderstandings. I mean, that's sort of the, the classic explanation that authority invites you to accept, basically, so that it all goes away. <laughs> um, and um, I have to say that that just doesn't work so well for me in the sense that when I look at the details of a, a wide range of reports that seem pretty serious and, and you know, substantial, it's just really hard to dismiss, you know, most of those in terms of um, mistakes or errors or misunderstandings. So, um, but it, it deserves to be one of the, you know, categories. Certainly, now for each of these four categories, we want to think about two things. We want to think about a priori, how plausible is that hypothesis, you know, setting aside any particular evidence we might use. And then secondly, we want to ask if that theory was true, how well would it account for or predict or, you know, um, explain the kinds of observations we might see? So those are two, in a standard Bayesian analysis, those are the two things you want from each category of hypothesis. You want a prior probability and you want a likelihood. What you usually do is you multiply those together and then you have those for everything and then you renormalize. You resum so everything adds up to one and then, you know, you're final probability is whichever one has the highest number, that's your best hypothesis, right? Yes. So um, the four main categories here would be one, mistake errors, right? Uh, two, um, it could be a hoax. That is, it could be some sort of organized attempt to fool people, uh, in which case there'd be a correlation among things. Somebody's behind this and somebody's lying and things like that. Both of these first two categories are consistent with there's not really anything there. Uh, it's just, you know, what we see. The other two categories basically say, no, there's really something there and it's really pretty spectacular. One of those would be there's some Earth-based organization that has much more powerful capabilities than anybody's acknowledged or admitted uh, or even expect. And the other is there's some non-Earth-based organization that has powerful abilities. Right. You know, so I, these are the four categories of explanation. And, I, yeah, you know, we want to think think about what the prior for each one is and what the likelihood. And then, you know, so that's how we go through the analysis. I'll, I'll pause and let you. No, no, no it's fine. I, I think the, the people that are most familiar with the work uh, that I and other people are involved in would actually agree very much with those categories. Um, one of the things that I fault the so-called ufology for is the chasing lights in the sky approach and everything is some mysterious thing. Um, then of course there is the hoax aspect, which is all the more easier in this time, day and age with uh, digital technology, et cetera, et cetera. I, I'll right. More into that. Then there is, uh, I'll go to the prospect of course of earthbound and information that we've been dealing with for, for some time posits that there has been on Earth the development of alternative craft going back over 100 years. Now, I just want to say that uh, there are things that I consider speculative in the information that I'm familiar with. And that means things that uh, pertain to the far distant past that we don't have access to or have not yet had any con confirmation ev with evidence and things in the as yet unarrived future. Having said that, in the middle of that, uh, and I'll, I'll finish with the fourth category where we're talking about something or things that come from somewhere else. And then of course we have to uh, uh, determine how we, well, we have to, how do we determine that? Now, where I said that you and I approach things differently, you are quite a scientist and a formal trained scientist. I'm a science researcher from my, my own initiative. Without background, something compelled me 43 years ago to jump into this topic. So I became, uh, ever since I was a child, fascinated with this phenomenon, et cetera. But I realized that there has to be evidence to support claims. And that was very dissatisfactory for me with the absolute majority of ufology. It's not that there aren't some authentic photos or films or whatever, but it doesn't go anywhere. Now, I want to jump back to uh, this idea of where we might have some overlaps in our interest. 
and uh, future of hum humanity, future of humankind, man predictions about the future, I think you have expressed, uh, you know, your own points of view, hypotheses, if you will, about this. And why don't you familiarize our audience with that, please? Okay, so we'll set aside the previous topic for the moment, and we will talk about the future. Um, yeah, we can come back to that. If sure. Will, but sure okay, so um, I've been around science fiction fans and futurists for a long time. And so I've been around people talking about the future for a long time. And I've been interested in like studying and, and doing what I can to be more metho metho methodical about it. Um, basically, most futurism isn't very structured or rigorous or, you know, analytic uh, compared to say most of the rest of academia or even compared to history. So, you know, in some sense history is, less important than the future because we can't do anything about it, but there's a far more people who study history because there's all these concrete things you can study and you, there's ways to just be methodical about it. And so a big problem about the future is how, how exactly do you study the future? And one of the key observations is it has to be pretty theoretical. That is <laughs> the past, you just have a lot of data about, and you just don't have much data about the future. So what you have to do is take your best theories that you've assembled from the past and the present, and then try to apply those theories to the future. So um, I've noticed that for a long time, a lot of people in technology um, that I used to be in, like computer science and physics and material science, they would um, use their best understanding of those technologies to make predictions about sort of the space of possible future technologies, like the kinds of technologies that plausibly will be possible. And that's an important contribution because it uses our theory of say physics or computers or material science to predict what technologies can and plausibly will happen. And then people who do technology, they often don't believe that social science exists. And so they think that whatever social speculations come to the top of their head are the best that anybody could do. And so then they feel right, somewhat free to just make social speculations about technology without much constraint. And that's to me frustrating because I moved from technology into social science and I realized there is a lot of social science and there's a lot of expert knowledge there. And so it's just not enough to take whatever comes to the top of your head as a technologist and use that to predict the future of technology. So I think it's also true that a lot of social scientists don't really appreciate what technologists have come up with in terms of what technologies we're pretty confident will in fact occur. Often those seem to social scientists as speculative or un ungrounded or something. And so we have this disconnect where social scientists looking at the future don't fully appreciate what the technologists have understood about what technologies will happen. And then the technologists don't appreciate that social scientists know a lot. And so I see one of my roles is just combining those two things, understanding what the social scientists know and the technologists know, and just taking both of those seriously and then asking, what does that imply? as a theorist. And so one of my efforts has been in this book called The Age of M, Work, Love and Life and Robots Rule the Earth. And in that book, I take seriously one of the technologies that technologists have, you know, predicted will in fact occur, uh, a pretty radical technology, but it seems pretty solid that eventually it will show up. And that's the technology of brain emulation. And then I've tried to apply all the social science I could to work out what that world would look like. And in particular, I've tried to, I filled my book with a lot of detail because a lot of people say, basically, there's just no way you could know what a social world would look like as a result of one of these technologies. The technologists sort of throw their hands up and say, it's just no way one could know. And I'm saying, yes, you could know. Let me show you in great detail exactly how that would play out. And so I'm trying to do that as a proof of concept to say, you really can take specific technology hypotheses and work out in substantial detail what kind of a future world that would look like applying all the social science we know. And, you know, I'm trying to prove to people that it's possible to do futurism that way. All right. You, I think you said brain emulation. Yes, that's the technology. Brain emulation. Um, is that uh, moving towards the AI concept or what does it really mean? So it's one of the several ways that we could make minds as smart as humans that were artificial. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we think of our, we're biological, say. Right, right. Uh, we're, you know, grown and, and uh, birthed. Yeah, yeah. And we make artificial things in factories. We, we make things and we build them. 
And one of the questions about the future is whether minds like ours that are in our head can be also made artificially and then make them as well or better than the minds that we make biologically. So a brain emulation is one way that could happen. Okay. I'm going to jump in because you're obviously information and idea rich, and I want to build for this where we can move together and I can share with you some things, but I, this is very important. And what it, um, there's a couple things that come right immediately into my mind that we're speaking about technology. We're speaking about consciousness, right? The development of consciousness. And we're speaking about predictions. We're speaking about the law of cause and effect as well, which is a, a, a focus, a great focus of what we uh, use to try to understand uh, the idea of the future and information about the future that we have, and just an understanding of how it is that human beings, through thought, feeling, and action process, you uh, there's, there's some things about the brain and how consciousness works I know you've got, so I'm going to jump back a little bit because as I said, I make I made notes, but it's when you're talking, I start looking to see what did I want to ask you about, because there's so there's so much rich stuff here. So, one of the things, let's go back for a second to the idea of about aliens, and it seems to me that there's a common assumption, uh, and that is we we speak about if we a lot of people speak about UFOs and extraterrestrials, and a lot of people use the term aliens, and and they speak. Uh, confidently about non-human intelligences for aliens. They're non-human. Where does that idea come from that this has to be, if you subscribe at all to it or have a point of view on it, where does this idea come from of non-human, aliens are non-human? So I would think of it in terms of the tree of life or the tree of ancestry. Um, On Earth, we usually understand the history of life on earth as a tree of ancestry, at least a a perhaps emerging branching tree of ancestry where things had ancestors and they descended from them and then changed as a result from their ancestors, you know, to be different. The descendants were different than the ancestors. Um, So uh, we use uh, that structure to categorize things in our world, life especially, Uh, And we do find that often related forms of life were related by having a common ancestor. Uh, That is, they came from the same place. Okay, yeah. And uh, so on Earth, we understand, you know, the history of life on Earth and the categorization and the relation among life on Earth at the moment in terms of this ancestry structure, what came from where. And so human is a label for a particular point in that ancestry structure. That is, at some point, there was this species, say a million or two million years ago on Earth that had certain features, lived in certain places. And if we call that human, then everything that descended from that then is human. And other species nearby and previously are not quite human. They're maybe proto-human or human siblings. And we can understand, you know, things before human as ancestors of humans. And we think of humans as one of many kinds of species on earth. And so then it's quite possible to have non-human intelligences. It would just be any other species on earth that was intelligent, that didn't descend from our ancestors, the humans. Um, In which case there's no problem, not, you know, with understanding the concept of non-human intelligence or non-human anything else, but We also have a standard story, which you might question, which is that uh, humans of, say, a million years ago had very limited technology and very limited abilities, and that those abilities have been gradually increasing over time, and that the human population has been increasing over time, and that only recently have we had very advanced capabilities like flying and nuclear power and things like that, and so if you were going to postulate some creatures that had those abilities, uh, now you would be a little more puzzled about calling them non-human because the only kind we typically expect to have existed or be around are 
ourselves recently with those characteristics, right? Mm -hmm. So um, if you're going to talk about non-human or any sort of intelligence with great technology that isn't coming from us, like one of the creatures we meet around us on the earth right now, now the puzzle is, well, where did it come from? What, what is its origin? What is its rela ancestry relationship to us? So one sort of ancestry relationship could be that, you know, I don't know, a hundred thousand years ago, there was some offshoot from the, you know, line we know about, and it created some civilization back then and had all sorts of technology. And, and somehow we've lost all records of that. And there's some, but some of them are still around or some artifacts are still around. That would be one sort of a path that might, we might think about, or we could even imagine like say octopuses, mm. you know, tens of million years ago, somehow in the, mm -hmm. the ocean or somewhere made their own civilization there. And then we never saw records of it, but somehow something is still left around and they have some amazing abilities, right? But that would be a non-human intelligence on earth and a scenario by which it might have amazing technologies. But the, 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 the scenario we think we're the most confident in by which such things would exist is just the idea that our universe is enormous and life of our form started somewhere in the universe. And, you know, there might be a very distant ancestor that just went off on some other very distant path, or there might be just some other completely different origin out there in this vast universe, which then traveled along a related path to eventually reach advanced technology like ours. That's, that's how you might have very different non-human intelligence. Right. Now, this, this is, interestingly enough to me, uh, and I think to the audience, is the overlaps here. We have this weaving thing going on that I'm very interested in. And it might sound like, what are you talking about? Because I'm not saying too much. I want to hear your thing, but I have questions about it. And I, I'm not shy about sharing, but I also don't want to just, as I said, bombard. So one of the things that I have always challenged people in ufology about is they, you know, I don't know how familiar you are with this nutty field. It's very unscientific. It's crazy. And according to some of these people, why there's extraterrestrials all over the place and they're contacting people and they're meeting people and channeling and all that. So long ago, I, I was positing this. If there are extraterrestrials and if there is some form of contact with some person or persons on earth, what's the reason for that? And I've said, if that's so, it's not for us to chase lights in the sky, and it's not for people like me and others to go out and have careers as UFO researchers. So I'll put it to you. If there are, what's the, what would be the reason for contacting us then? So, so let's go back to the four categories of theories, just to be clear. So um, we talked about how in each category of theory, we want to have a prior analysis, like that is how plausibly is that theory, you know, category theory is just to be true. And then another analysis of for the particular sightings or whatever that people see, how, you know, how well is that explained by that theory? Uh, and so then I, I want to like put myself up as a personal expert and say, I'm more of an expert on the priors than I am on the likelihoods in the sense that I have skimmed and looked at some of the evidence, but I'm not going to put myself as an expert who's gone through that in great detail. I'm going to say, but I am an expert somewhat on these priors. That is, I can tell you about what are the most plausible theories with each of, each of these categories a priori, and then uh, you know, what's the relative size of these, and then talk about how that might fit with the evidence. So um, again, we have the four theories. There's like just mistakes, hoaxes, you know, strange earth or organizations and strange non-Earth organizations, right? So, so um, in that category, I'd have to say um, the the hoaxes, I'm sorry, the, the mistakes are just a priori enormously likely. Mm -hmm. My rough guess is they don't do that well explaining the data. So that we're gonna have to look at one of the other three categories, but a priori, it's overwhelmingly likely that there would just be lots of mistakes. I mean, and no doubt there are, and most likely like 95% of, UFO reportings are, are mistakes, mm -hmm. are misunderstandings. You know, that's completely reasonable, if, but it's about the other 5%. And my judgment is that that just doesn't work very well. Okay. Then we've got these other three categories of theories. 
Now, if we go to the hoax category, we'd say, well, you know, if somebody were to set up a hoax like this, it would have to be a pretty organized hoax. That is, they'd have to like do a lot of different things and coordinate a lot of different people to all lie and, you know, set up things to mislead people. But humans have done that sort of thing in the past. <laughs> and so, you know, I might say, you know, the United States government has done things somewhat like this in the past, and they're kind of centrally near a lot of these sightings, and they have some reasons why they might want to do this. So I might say there's maybe a 1% prior here that that sort of thing would be plausible. And now we have to ask, like, how does that fit the evidence? And we can go into that, but I might say, you know, a priori, the plausibility of, you know, mistakes is really high. Just I don't think it fits the evidence that well. The plausibility of a hoax is 1%, still not crazy, you know, that's not crazy low. Mm -hmm. And I might say, honestly, the evidence fits a hoax pretty well in the sense that somebody who was trying to fool us and lie, they, they could lie about all the stuff we've mm -hmm. people have said they've seen. That, that would be feasible. Mm -hmm. So I got to like put that there. And now I go to the other two categories and I go, okay, what about some hidden earth organization like one of the nations on earth, for example, that we know about that like is not revealing its technologies, right? And if I go into that, I go, well, that's just not so a priori plausible because you know the various channels by which that might be leaked just seems so many that is you know we have to postulate some ability that has these amazing abilities and somehow just doesn't use it mm -hmm. <laughs> doesn't yeah. gain geopolitical advantage from it mm -hmm. but somehow lets it be seen once in a while that's sort of mm -hmm. odd so i got to not put that one very much but if we get to the to the aliens one i have to say well i have an expertise in that and so what I can come up with a most plausible scenario under which that would happen. And I would give that roughly a one in a thousand prior. And so I would say, you know, with respect to the hoax, the prior is less, but the evidence could well favor it if you, if you went into the detailed evidence. So those would be the two categories I would call most to your attention by saying, you know, those look best. So, so now if you're asking about the sort of an aliens hypothesis and what's the most plausible version of that, mm -hmm. that seems to me related to your question of what, what's their purpose? Like, what, what, why would they be here? What, what, right. what, what's going on here, right? Mm -hmm. So if I, if I understood the question then, right? I'm that just gets right it. it gets right to it. And before you jump, let me throw in another flavor on that since you're about to address that. How, it's not only then why, which you, you, you're about to expound on, but how do you think they would contact us? Not simply appear, but how? Oh, so, right, so we, we need a hypothesis about their origin, their nature, their agenda, and their activities. We need a, a whole hypothesis that includes all that such mm -hmm. that it would then make predictions about what you would see, Okay. right? You, if you just have a hypothesis about part of it, then you're missing the other parts. So you need a whole story. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, look, obviously, um, I, as I say, I tend to be evidence-based and sure. I only care because with so much of what's being done now socially around this topic, you know, uh, two years ago, it was strictly tabloid topic. You were ridiculed. It was a tinfoil hat thing. And now everybody and their brother thinks they're an expert in all this stuff. Right. You know I mean? so, and I, and I want to make sure that I'm only putting myself out as an expert on certain aspects of oh, no, this. No, I and then I'm going to show you how I'm an expert on that. So that I agree that we should hold people to that standard. We shouldn't just let everybody speculate, nor should we just shut everybody down because it's taboo. We need right, to so, like be honest about it. Well, what I, I, I'm going to give you the option right here. Do you want to right now continue to expound on that, which is fine with me? Do you want me to start to introduce what my work is about and incorporate it into the discussion, or you want it, whatever you like. I, I think at this point, I might as well just finish the thought. Please do. That I've been setting up here. It'll, it'll may take another 10 minutes, and then hey. I'll be done, and then you can, you know, <laughs> bring your stuff that I haven't figured out or thought about, and I will just have to react. Okay. <laughs> I'm happy to do that. But uh, basically, my expertise is on sort of the cosmology basically and sort of where in space-time aliens might be and what they might be doing. So first I have this basic analysis of just, you know, the or appearance of advanced life like us. So, so basically 
uh, on a planet like Earth, life had to go through a number of difficult steps. And each step was very hard. And there was a deadline of when the window for life on a planet would end. And so um, that gives us a mathematical model of, uh, you know, basically when and where life appears, because uh, it has to start down this path on a planet and then get lucky going luckily fast through a number of steps before the window for life closes. And so that says that, so roughly on a cosmological scale, things appear at random places in space, but they appear according to a power law in time, which has you know, been increasing over time. So there's a lot more stuff happening lately than far along. And the last part of the model is then just when they appear, what happens next? And so the story is some advanced life goes less appears and then just stays local and quiet and maybe dies soon or takes a long time, but it doesn't make much of a co cosmic impact. And so you really can't see it much in the sky, mm -hmm. but it would just be there if you got close enough to see it. And then some other kinds of aliens become what I call grabby aliens. Mm -hmm. They decide to expand and then they relatively soon expand as fast as they can. And there's some rate at which they expand. So we've got these three parameters of a model of where they are in space time. There's two parameters of power law of when they appear in time. And then there's this rate of expansion and we can actually fit all of these three parameters to data. So we actually have a decent estimate of all these parameters. And we have the observation that you need to believe this because otherwise we're kind of crazy early. That is, if, if, a, if, the universe would just stay empty until life would appear. This model says that the most, the typical time when it would happen would be trillions of years from now. So we're, we're at the moment, the universe is only 14 billion years old. So we're really early in the universe compared to when it would happen if the universe would stay empty. Therefore, it's not going to stay empty. Therefore, these aliens are out there right now filling up the universe within, say, roughly a billion years. It'll all be full. And that's why we had to appear now. But they still appear very, very rarely, say roughly once per million galaxies. And that's sort of the overall story of gravity aliens. I'm going to leave, I'm leaving a lot of the details because we're just going to like mm -hmm. set, say this and then set it aside because this story does not give you any way to explain UFOs as aliens. <laughs> Under this theory, again, we'll meet them in a billion years if we expand out there. They appear once per million galaxies, but they're so rare. There's just no way there's any one, other one around here. And it just doesn't leave you an opening for that. And so this theory just says that just can't happen. But we can make a variation on this theory. So a variation on this theory is based on the idea of panspermia, the idea that life didn't start on Earth. It started somewhere else. And therefore, maybe started another 5 billion years before our planet started and went through a great many other steps. And then life was transferred somehow, say a rock smashed in and threw a rock off and drifted away, landed somewhere, and then... Earth was seeded with life early in its history. Um, but that creates the op option that uh, it if it's seeded Earth very early in its history, at that, mo at that time, Earth was part of a stellar nursery full of thousands of stars, all close together with lots of rocks flying back and forth. So if it had seeded Earth, then it would plausibly also have seeded many of the other stars planets around the other stars in that birth group. And then over the last 5 billion years ago, you know, that, that so stars drifted apart and spread across the galaxy. And so life would also be on many of those other planets. They would be our panspermia sibling planets. <laughs> and one of those may have reached our level before us. And if it did, it would just be a few thousand light years away, not a million galaxies away. <laughs> And that would have created this correlation of life nearby. Uh, but the statistics say that if they showed up before us, it would have been, say, at least 100 million years before us. So the scenario would be life reached an advanced level somewhere in our galaxy on one of these panspermia sibling planets 100 million years ago. And then in between then and now, they traveled to here and then are here with some sort of an agenda. So what I've said so far sets up part of the story, but it doesn't explain all the things we need to explain. So what, what I wanna have is, I'm gonna describe again quickly and then we'll hand the floor over to you. If I'm trying to construct a scenario that makes sense of UFOs as aliens, um, 
one of the elements I'm going to introduce is this idea of panspermia siblings. That is, we're just going to assume that there was panspermia and there was a sibling and one of those siblings did in fact achieve advanced life before we did. But that's not enough to actually explain the thing we observe. So I need to add a few more elements and that's partly why the scenario's probability is going to fall because I have to add a couple elements to make it work, which is why maybe it's you know not as plausible because I have to do a couple of things here. So one of the key observations that we can see is, you know, 100 million years ago, somewhere else in the galaxy, there was this other advanced life and they did not fill a galaxy or the universe. That's just a fact we'd have to accept from this hypothesis, right? And what we can reason theoretically is that's actually pretty hard. That is, if they're a civilization with lots of different parts, if any one part of them left their home world, went off, tried to colonize the universe, the galaxy would be full and we wouldn't see what we see and we wouldn't you know, necessarily even be here. So they must have tried hard and succeeded at preventing their civilization from going out and expanding and colonizing. That's a, that's the fact we'd have to infer about them from the fact that they are hundred million years old or nearby, but everything else looks empty around here. They didn't go fill it. So that's one element we need of the scenario is we have to postulate they did not want to expand and they didn't want any part of them to it. And they set down a rule preventing that because that's how we have to explain that everything looks empty around. So, but that sets up a plausible agenda for why they're here. You know, given that they did not want to expand and anything colonized, and if they can infer that we might be out here and they can guess that we might be here and go through our development, they can guess that we might violate this rule. They don't come here and stop us or do something to us. We might plausibly start to expand, fill the universe nearby, and you know, violated their rule. So a plausible reason they're here is to prevent us from violating that rule. Mm -hmm. Now, another thing we know is almost certainly they could just have destroyed us. That wouldn't be very hard for them. So clearly they chose not to do that, right? So clearly they've got some priority on persuading us rather than merely forcing us to. To, to not violate the rule. Okay, so that goes a, a ways toward the scenario. It's why they aren't everywhere else and why they're here, but we still have one more key thing to explain. Because again, they're, they're, real, they're far more advanced than us and they're here for, on, you know, to prevent us from expanding, but there are two strategies they could have taken that they did not take, which is somewhat puzzling. That is, they could have just been completely visible and make themselves known. They could have, you know, made it completely obvious that they're here, talk to us about them, tell us about their rule. And that's a thing they could have done. And that would have worked in some level, but they didn't do that, right? And the other thing they didn't do is just be completely invisible. That is, again, 100 million years more advanced than us. They, they could have just a dark satellites out there. We wouldn't ever see them. They could watch completely high res down here, see everything they want to see. They wouldn't need to be visible at all. So they didn't choose either of those strategies. Okay, so under by the UFOs as aliens hypothesis, they are hanging out at the edge of visibility, being somewhat noticeable, but not very. And uh, we have to explain why. Well, why, why would they pick that intermediate level of visibility rather than being completely visible or completely invisible? Okay, so now I add the last part of my hypothesis in order to make up this story to make sense. I have to say, why are they doing this intermediate level? And the, the hypothesis I offer is that they want to inspire us to follow their example by becoming the top of our status hierarchy. So when we domesticate other animals, like dogs, what we do is we convince them we're a dog and we're the top dog. <laughs> we, and the way we do that is just by doing the sorts of things they would do to be high status. Uh, to be impressive, powerful, et cetera. And so their idea is, you know, if most basically social species have a status hierarchy, then the way they can convince us to follow their example is by just being the top dog here. Come around, be here, not out there. So they have to like seem like they're nearby one of us and they have to be very impressive and just consistently do that. And eventually we'll be convinced they're there and that they're really impressive. And then we may well go along with follow their example. So, you know, this is what ancient emperors might do to get their, you know, subjects to 
obey them and to accept them as they just have a huge pyramid, have a huge temple, have a big crown, have a big parade, biggest army. You just have big, impressive stuff. Everybody says, okay, I guess you're the top. So that would be the, the scenario. And, you know, the last thing to mention is just, um, you know, on earth, when, when we meet other humans on earth, we like other humans compared to other animals. We, we get along, but, you know, we're pretty sensitive about any little difference deciding they must be evil. <laughs> and so that's a, the thing. So like, if they, they want us to defer to them, they can't let us see them as evil. <laughs> that won't work. Right. So, uh, but the fact is they are aliens and they don't actually know that much about us when they start up this whole plan. And so there's this risk almost any way they reveal a lot of information about themselves to us, we're probably going to hate something. And then this all goes off that we, we don't defer to them. They're not our top dog. There's some weird alien. Right. And so that's why they have to be sort of be impressive, but not show much detail. They can't, you know, give you life history and all, all the, every, you know, they can't tell you lots of stuff about them. Otherwise we, we would just hate something. And so we don't. And so that's the idea. So the scenario again is panspermia siblings did not colonize the universe, had a rule against it, are here to prevent, enforce the rule, but they want to do that by inspiring us. They didn't destroy us. And so the idea is just to be at the top of a status hierarchy by being visibly impressive, but not showing much other detail. And I put all those together and that's where I come up with, say, a one in a thousand prior. Okay, I had to add some elements to the story to all make it work. Each element I add needs to be penalized in the prior calculation. And so that's where I am. But I'd say a one in a thousand prior is still not crazy low. If you actually see stuff and the evidence is strong enough, then maybe you got to believe it. I mean, or, you know, unless one of the other hypothesis, you know, categories of explanation works better, like maybe the hoax category works better. But that's what I'd give you. So now I'm done. Oh, that's great. My, um, as you were going through this, my inner reflection as you're going along is these waves that intersect and some pl places they are very far from each other. They get closer sometimes, you understand? So what I'm uh, driving at is um, I'm going to talk about two types of things, informational things, because there's stuff in the informational body that I think you'd resonate with in terms of the theories. There's some that you would say, well, it can't be or whatever, but then there's the other part. And that is the, for me, what is important is, <clears throat> pardon me, is the evidence. What is the evidence? Because we tend to, you know, uh, focus a lot on this. So I'm gonna show you some things and at, because I'm gonna try to do my share screen here and okay, I'll get, but speak up at any time because it probably okay. won't be seeing you. Can you see that? Um, I see a picture of a saucer in front of a tree. Right. So let me start to explain a little bit here about what you're about to be seeing. And my own background goes back about 43 years, 1979. I walked into a bookstore and there was a photo book, coffee table kind of photo book. And I'm looking at things that I've only dreamt of and I didn't have dreams as clear. So I get the book and I start my process without overdoing the personal story. I'm going to walk through some of this. This is one, this particular photo is one in a series of nine that was taken in 1975, pre-digital. Everything I'll show you is pre-digital. And it was taken by a man in Switzerland who's over 85 right now. And he has one hand. So some of these are factors because a lot of what you were talking about in the hoax, in that very important quadrant, you know, there the hoax theory thing has been looked at. And it's certainly open to question any at any point. But let me start to just go through, say a few words about it. And then if, the, if you don't have a comment or question, but I will point out in this photo alone, we have an object in front of a tree and we can see reflections in the surface of this object. People have hoaxed UFO photos and films for a long time. So why would this be taken at all seriously? Well, let's see. All right, I think I might've jumped over one that I wanted to, yes. Now this is a rather unfamiliar looking type of a thing. To put it mildly, these Thank photos uh, at any point just 
I talk over me so I know if you want to say something. The man is standing approximately 15 feet away from this object. And um, there have been enormous numbers of skeptical attacks, obviously, about this and the other 63 photos that he took of this object at different times and the video that he took where he has the object in the distance and he moves into the frame. So he's videotaping it with an old pre-digital video camera while he's in the frame and talking. I might be able to pull that up if you wanna see it, but I wanted to just go through photos for a moment. We don't see in the photography of so-called UFOs anything nearly, and I have, have some other photos of this kind of detail and workmanship. Doesn't mean it's authentic, it just is an interesting note. There are many, there are, he took over 1,200 of these primarily, but not exclusively daytime photos of these craft and different angles. Um, these, this is all being photographed in Switzerland. The locations are pretty well known with the exception of a few people can go. I've, I've gone myself and walked through. This is another one of that series of nine where this supposed craft is in a different part of the tree and he's moved his perspective. He's somewhere else, but we still see this reflection of, and even the, if this is a real tree and not a miniature and all that, we see the darkening, the foliage is, is there. We notice here dissimilar metals, flanging work and some kind of stuff. If the man, well, maybe he's just a brilliant metallurgist and he can make these things and somehow stick them up in the air. This is one of the closer ones where he's ostensibly in one of these craft taking photos out the window. We have a couple more photos where these objects are above the ground, ones even in the distance, et cetera. Here's yet another one in that series of nine. I don't know that we have all nine of them here, but so it's slightly angled. We still see reflections. This is clearly, you know, landscape back here. Um, now he has three. This is taken from a, a film. Eight of the films that he took survived where he would film the objects and very often would, according to him, he was told to film from behind a tree or something. Why is that? Because then the foreground objects will be clearer and you'll be able to tell that the objects in the distance are less distinct, less clear. People, when they start to analyze the photographs, and we'll get to that, uh, will want to know that. Now, in the film that we have, and I'm not running through showing you everything on Earth, I'm right. just trying to introduce right. this. These two are fairly stationary, but they are rotating. This is fully stationary as much as so. And then these two suddenly disappear, and that one remains. And the film goes on for a little while. It's kind of an interesting film. He films an, another uh, opportunity where he puts the tripod tripod in front. Now, are these simply little models suspended? If they were small models suspended, they will have to be clearer because they have to be closer to this thing. There's a lot of, we'll talk about the analyses and things. So this, he is either in a craft or up on a hillside and these have come in and they're two different types of objects. So now does this man have resources to be doing all of this metallurgy, let alone pretty good filmmaking. So here in that silver object we saw in the second, we now see this object, the gold. It obviously looks like it's just a model with a light on it in front of a black curtain, or so we were told by skeptics. I had detected about eight years ago that this portion, uh, the dimensions on this portion had changed in the two photographs. This burnished looking area was not visible before. In fact, this seam and this seam were virtually butted together. And then a couple of years ago, when some independent uh, analysts were using the contemporary technologies we have today, very much more sophisticated than the original ones, they came upon that and other things. And there's a 74 page report on this. So here we have a, a you know a little bit of a closer shot on these. So so can we pause and anytime uh, back ahead. up? So the uh, you know as you know you know in terms of official reports people are given about UFOs, there's like at least a hundred thousand out there, sure. right? And so 
given all those reports, obviously one can be a little picky. One can afford to be a little picky because the question is, okay, even if most of them are, uh, you know, mistakes or even hoaxes, but you know, there's a, a room for a lot of very hard to explain ones. So, right. presumably, what we are most interested in doing is going among the hardest to explain reports and trying to ask, you know, just how hard are they to explain, uh, i.e., explain as hoaxes or mistakes. Um, and so, if you're looking at like what would be the criteria of something that was hard to explain, then it seems, you know, it's not original to me, but it seems obvious that two kinds of criteria you'd want to do are how many people were involved, how many different, say, disconnected, uncoordinated people, you know, say they saw the things. And then you might have how many sort of different kinds of evidence do you have and wow. how many different channels of evidence do you have? That is, the more different people who are unrelated and the more different sure. kinds of evidence, then that would be a more persuasive case because, uh, you know, it would be hardest, harder to make up a story for how they could have all come together to see the same thing from different angles through the different kinds of cameras, different kinds of detectors, et cetera. So, so for example, the, the Nimitz, uh, you know, episode right. in 2004, what's most, you know, especially impressive about that is you have a whole bunch of different people with different sort of equipment, different sort of relationships, different sort of positions using recording in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. And then with, you know, the time for them to have synchronized and compare Right. That that's especially impressive. So, you know, when I look at this, I can say, yes, I mean, clearly, you know, in terms of the sharpness of the images, you've got sharp images and you've got this one guy and you got some different things, but I want to know, well, was it only ever this one guy? No, let's let me, other people were involved. Let, right? me, you, let me jump in. And what I'll do, if it's okay with you, and if at any point I'm going to just, while I try to answer your question, I'll scroll through some of these so that because there's some things in particular I want you to see. But if there's anything that catches your eye, fine. If not, we're just letting things fly by while we answer that. So what uh, I would say is this. Um, there have been to date about 120 eyewitnesses, sometimes single, but oftentimes in gr groups of people who also observed these objects and five other photographers, including people in other countries who didn't know about this, but simply actually either cap uh, deliberately clicked an, an image of an object in the sky, or as in this particular photograph, they were photographing the people. And when they developed, again, this is 35 millimeter film and all, they found that this object was present in the film, in the photographic film. Now, let me go back because we left out an area, two areas that are very important in discussing this evidence. Now, as you acknowledge, uh, these photos are extraordinarily clear. The, uh, the images I've seen, anything I've seen from the Nimitz and the Tic Tac and all are clearly inferior for detail, but they capture interesting phenomena. They do. Um, but again, we don't know what that means. Now, let's just say that we've talked about the fact that there are, um, and I'll, I'll settle on this one in a minute, I'll come back to this. Let's just say that there are indeed 120 eyewitnesses. I happen to be one. I've been within 20. This years. image is of five saucers and no. five planes? No, this is a composite. And I, I will, I'll, I'll give you the, the reason I stopped on it because I happen to be the person who discovered the nine photos that were used in putting together this composite. And uh, I think I'll be able to, let's see here, get back to, but I'll, I'll go through some of the, I'm gonna give you better versions of these because I will explain what those were how we came by them. Again, this man took 1,200 of these, so many are, we could go, oh, well, there's just another one over the countryside, but wait a minute, we don't have this from the government. We have this from a one-armed man in Switzerland and five other people who have taken photos mainly accidentally of the same objects and including a man who was a very virulent skeptic in this man's village who had attacked him in writing and send him nasty letters and then send him a letter saying, I was outside in my field and I happened to take some photographs. Right. I'd like to come over and apologize. Okay. But we're going to, I want to address right. something that you didn't mention. Now this is 
this object and this photograph, uh, this is from the video. And if necessary, we can bring the video up. I, you may or may not want to see every single thing. Here, right. Here's let's get to the the part that you didn't hit on. When people come forward with phot photographic evidence, let's say in this day and age, it's highly unreliable because you can hoax anything pr practically, even though these photographs remain still irreproducible, despite the best efforts of a skeptics, including one that I helped back in 2009 to try to make his best, best efforts and best effects. So what we have glossed over is that there are methods for analyzing photographs and films. Right. There are things that uh, are done with state-of-the-art equipment. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to just pause that thought for a minute so you can see something. For instance, what we see here on screen left is that object that the skeptic said is a gold model against the black curtain. If you pluck the image off of my website and you put it into Photoshop, which I'm not an expert at, and you adjust brightness and contrast, you will get something like the photo on the right, where this is a large object hovering over a graveled road with one of those Swiss meter things there. Here's a grassy, and there's a you know grassy hillside mm -hmm. here. There's so, a couple. So, so if we pause for a moment, um, yeah. so I mean, previously I mentioned how in order to believe uh, more in some particular sighting, we want a lot of different people and a lot of different kinds of evidence. Right. Uh, the other big thing we want is evidence of amazing abilities, because if you don't see amazing abilities, you could just say, okay, yeah, it really was real. It was weird, but it but so wasn't what? amazing because it's, it's an ordinary thing. Right. So, yes. so, yeah. so that's that in this sightings, you haven't shown me that yet. You haven't yeah, shown because me this is sort a, of amazing this is abilities. A, this is the eye candy. This is the easy stuff. Because remember I said, there's information and then there's the hard evidence. And I, before I get on to the other part of it, um, what I, uh, I'll just show you a couple more things. Then I want to get into what you just brought up. Because remember, we, I asked, what would the reason be for extraterrestrials? It's not for us to chase lights or even great objects in the sky. It's not even for you and I to be speaking. It's something else. So I'll show you something that I was present when this photograph was taken, just to lay it on a bit. These are photographs taken in 1964. There were a bunch of them in India. The man is seated on the ground and a British woman has the camera and she photographs this. Now, when I saw the photo from about four or five feet away, I thought that looks like somebody painted this cross on the photo or they used adhesive tape, right? I mean, what's it? So we brought the film camera up close and we grabbed this image from it. And this, these photos from 64 were taken with what's called a Kodak Bellows camera. You may or may not know. It's a very primitive Kodak ca ca uh, camera. My father had one in the 40s and they're miserable things. You just roll the thing out, you click and you hope you got. Well, this is not any effect. There is nothing on this film on the surface. I mean, my uh, cameraman guy is professional. We examine, this is a, simply a photograph of a cross floating in the sky, basically just about a guy's head. Okay, let's leave that for the moment. Now, let's go back to the what was done in terms of analysis, and you also mentioned evidence, and then I'm going to move on to the important stuff, the higher standard of proof. Because frankly, the debate about UFOs, if you can see anybody ever take better photos than this or films, that's fine. But it's a debate that people will still have, even if the thing sets down in front of them. So I'll just tell you, here's uh, the photos that I discovered in a storage unit in Moab, Utah, in 20, uh, October 2020. That um, object that you see, that plane, has been identified by... <sighs> aviation specialists with Air Force technology, that was a top secret stealth attack plane. Okay. And, and when we, uh, I've got other articles, I'm not going to so say. But this was a, this is in Switzerland. So is that a Swiss plane? No, or, okay. no, it's not. That's what's so amazing. See, they had a photograph taken of a Mirage jet in Switzerland behind one of the UFOs. And it was on the cover of the darn book I bought. I thought I, I went through 24 boxes in a stuffy storage unit in Moab, Utah, two days. Last box, 
I open it up and here are these photos. And I look, I see a plane and I see, I saw, okay, some more from that Mirage thing. I'm going to get them, send these to Billy in Switzerland. I send them to them and I say, hey, I think that maybe some more. They write me back and they say, that's not a Mirage and that's not Switzerland and that Billy didn't take them. So this is just for the sake of the story because there are no, try as we might, we have not been able to trip up. And I mean, try as we might, because I don't want to be fooled. Right. So the story about this is, and then there was something more important than the story. June of 1981 was the debut flights and some top secret flights of this particular stealth. When one of the people I work with went and magnified these images, and I could show them to you, but unless you want them, I'm going to leave them and send them to you later. This isn't a black plane. This plane is painted in camouflage. And there is apparently only one time in June of 81 that the camouflage stealth fly. Now, remember, I'm finding these photos. I sent them off to Switzerland. We find out that the lead military investigator, there was a guy who investigated this case with two uh, top-level uh, private investigators. He set the whole uh, investigation in motion officially in 1977, 78. He was the man who took these photos ostensibly with the help of the woman who supposedly, if I can be doing enough disclaimers, was piloting this thing. I sent one photo off to a Kodak film expert and I said to him, please tell me the following. What can you tell me about the objects here in this photo, any manipulations, and please tell me about the information on the back of the photo? He wrote back, and we have that too. If I had to testify, I would say the following, and I'm paraphrasing. Two objects are present at the same time in the photo. The one in the foreground, the disc-shaped object, is basically in the photo you sent me. Stationary, there is the indication of motion in the airplane. There's no evidence of using any kind of overlay manipulation or technology. So I would have to say this photograph is authentic, taken. Now here's, we flipped the photo over, he said, and the text on the back shows that this was developed in the 1980s by Kodak. It's pre-digital and there you've got it. Now we've had other people look, there's even more information about so it. I, I feel like I'm getting overwhelmed with details yes. here and I don't know which details to pay attention to because I don't know where you're going with this. Okay, so what I'm so, gonna do is so I'm gonna say okay. to you, all right. So give, me your, say, give me the thesis that you're gonna try right. to what support I'm do, on the basis of this. Yes, what I'm going to say is independent analyses of the photos, sound recordings, metal alloy samples by a scientist at IBM all show that the materials recorded, photographed, and filmed were not hoaxed. The metals were not, uh, couldn't be duplicated by IBM scientist Marcel Vogel with any technology he had. There's a video about that. The sound recording stumped four separate sound engineers. I've been in one of the studios myself. They said, we can't duplicate the sounds. This was back in the seventies. We now have more recent analyses. The same thing comes up. So here's where we get into the more interesting and what are we talking about in this case. You, I'm going to briefly touch on this because you spoke about the universe and all. We have in this case what I call the higher standard of proof, which are literally hundreds of specific examples of prophetically accurate scientific, environmental, geopolitical, medical, financial, and other information. I don't call this uh, a prophetically accurate information, which is why I'm not going into all this stuff. I can send it to you because they talk about the dimensions of things in the universe and light years and all this stuff. The man himself claims that he meets with these people and that he uh, trans he's transcribed hundreds of the conversations in which they have given him a voluminous amount of this type of information. So I'm going to go to a, a small sample of that that I presented to a uh, JPL USGS scientist who works on the imaging for the so, Mars. So region. you showed me some pictures from some buddy in Swiss, and now you're talking about some other documents and some I'm other evidence or claims that some, somebody talked to somebody else. I don't know who we're talking about here. Sure, we're talking about the same man 
And the man who photographs all this claims, as I said, he's over 85. And I look, Robin, I know this is a lot. No matter what you think of it, it's a lot. We don't have any beliefs about this. We simply have information and evidence, and there are means of vetting it. And that's where we, where okay. I actually want you to come in and not in this particular moment. This is like, you know, I've got the kitchen sink going. So let me explain this part. This man claims that since childhood, he's met with human beings who operate those craft, who come from a very great distance from earth. They have explained quite a bit about their own history, things that are not unlike and dissimilar to some of what you're um, hypotheses are about some that are different about the nature of this universe and other things, but a lot of things that pertain to things close to us, close to us, things that our scientists are involved with. I'm going to skip over the things about the information that he was given back in the seventies and mid eighties about black holes and galaxies, even though the purpose for listing them is that all of that information above, which is copyright verified, copyright verified, was corroborated always subsequently by NASA, JPL, other scientific discoveries. And that's why, I've, you know, black so, so he wrote down things he heard. And then some of those things, at least later on, are seem to be what the consensus is. But he wrote them down earlier than the consensus had formed. So we'd, we'd need to look in the details of which of those things were how surprising to judge right? whether he was just, you know, Lucky expressing guess. a consensus that was, you know, hadn't sure. been confirmed, but it was widely believed versus something that sure. he had something that was very surprising relative to the then current consensus. Sure. That would Let be me, the Yeah, yeah. Let me toss uh, an example. I'm not looking at it. It's not on, uh, we have it somewhere else, but let me toss an example of that at you that grabbed my attention. And I ended up calling at when I was looking at a uh, scientist at Cornell University who was involved with the Voyager project. In October of 1978, this man published an alleged conversation with these people. He's published to date well over 800. He speaks and somebody else is supposedly speaking. He is talking to this woman that he claims to be with in her object and he says, Ah, yes, that's Jupiter. You've given me information about that before. And now what I'm seeing is Io. If I remember correctly from our previous conversations, Io is the most volcanically active body in the solar system. The ejecta coming out of the volcanoes is propelled up at speeds of something like 26, 2800 kilometers per hour. The ejecta that does not escape uh, the propulsive efforts of the volcanoes and is drawn back down gravitationally contributes to the unusually smooth surface of this vol highly volcanic moon. Much of that ejecta is taken up into the Taurus of Jupiter. And there's, oh, there's Europa. And as I recall, that's ice encrusted. So you're, now, you're, you're going through a lot of details here, but again, you know, I can't ma master all the detail. I'm not sure where you're no going way. with it. Okay. That was five months before JPL. NASA, on March 12th, 1979, held a news conference, I think it was a Monday, and they, among the other things they said is, the most important discovery of the Voyager mission was that Io is the most volcanically active body in the solar system. A year later, in oh, Okay, April, but, but so, yeah, but the question is how, what people thought before that announcement nobody uh, that we know of uh, this is why what i did when i started I, but, I, okay I, but, but just not knowing isn't the same as knowing what they thought right well if you just don't know what they thought then it's not so much a conflict okay hold on so what i did is i every time i come upon any specific scientific information that i've never heard about before i went as other people have done we have a team of people doing this we go online and we search that topic Io, discovery, most volcanic. And if you go to JPL, NASA, and all this stuff, you try to find anything mentioning volcanic activity on Io, it does not exist. I, we couldn't find it. And I'm going to, I'll jump and I'll give you something dramatic because I might as well, since this is, I know this is overwhelming, but I, 
I want, I have a greater purpose than trying to overwhelm me. I can do hundreds of these in a variety of sciences. But recently, in February, February 25th, 2020, I published a transcript from these people, from this man in Switzerland, of information allegedly provided to him by these people. It had a dozen or more specific things warning about the COVID pandemic. Some of the documentation that we got subsequent to that dated back to November of 2019. In every case, and including all of the subsequent information, based on our searches, and including by doctors, not only has everything that they've stated, including this recent, this new surge that's going on, proved to be accurate, it's always published before all official sources. So I'm going to just say the reason I ask about the reason why any ETs would contact us. I determined this as far back as 2004, in my own opinion, the reason for the Meyer contacts is to help us assure our very threatened future survival. What mechanisms do we have for vetting? If we are provided with a speaking to us in the science, language of science, not in the highfalutin language of math. And uh, there's plenty of this light year stuff and stuff way beyond my pay grade in here. But this is stuff that anybody, when, he, when he's publishing as far back as 1976, the information about- Okay, so, so let, let's stop and summarize. Sure. Um, you know, like I said, as far as I, I you know, roughly there's been 100,000 UFO sighting reports, you know, right. over, over the decades, right? So that's a lot of them. And a lot of them, you know, are pretty impressive in the sense they have a lot of details, a lot of different people involved, a lot of different kinds of evidence. No. And, and I mean, no. they're, 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 I mean, the point is we have to engage all that different evidence and, and that's part of the problem. So I was saying, you know, I am not specialist in this kind of evidence, but I, right. you know, my quick, my quick browsing of it says that it, it needs to be taken seriously. Uh, one kind of evidence that you're bringing up is, is more of a traditional sort of uh, prophecy sort of evidence. Uh, that is, uh, that, that's not an, a, that's not a, such a usual kind of UFO evidence, which would be more about sightings, right? Right. So uh, just to, just to jump in on you, it, it's just so we stay current. There are many many reported sightings and photographs and films. There's no other evidence whatsoever that I've been made aware of that has ever been shown to be not of terrestrial manufacture. And so far- I mean, the, I mean, the point is like, there's a lot of these purported evidence. There are a lot of disputes about them. You're obviously an advocate about one particular set of evidence and that's fair. It's the only uh, I found. <laughs> okay. Uh, and But you're bringing multiple lines of evidence here. You're yes. saying, well, you have these pictures, you have these reports, and then you have these, in essence, prophecies, i.e., things this person said that later on seemed to be true. And so no. that's an evidence for the information source or later on seemed to be the say NASA consensus, right? Uh, IO's volcanic activity or something, right? You say somebody has a source where they said ahead of time that later on, you know, that would be how people thought about it. And that's seen as evidence for their having a source of information, right? No, 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 no. Wait, just to be specific in the language, he publishes specific information, very detailed, right. wherein later our scientists come right. up with new findings. Not right. Right. But, that's, but you're treating that as evidence for his reports. That is, these were not made up reports. There is something right. true about them. And right. part of the evidence for that is the fact that the reports early on made claims about IO, et cetera, that were later on become more accepted by you know, NASA, et cetera, right? So that's- no, Well, they, NASA, dis, no, no, NASA discovers this truth. However you want to phrase it. But the point is it's one of many lines of evidence, yes. right? So yes. in the larger scale, we just have all these different reports with many different sources, some of which are, you know, uh, hard to explain. And many of the, I, I know enough to know that many sort of, of these sorts of reports often come with stories about, you know, indications, what do these people want, right? And, you know, it often does tend to fit with sort of environmental, avoid war, peace, you know, other sorts of, you know, generally good seen as good things. 
uh, but they don't necessarily all agree with each other. So there's a bit of a challenge, like if you have your reports and your person says this and somebody else's person said another thing, and then we have to decide, you know, do, well, how do we deal with the conflicts or the differences or, or, you know, do we believe any of them? You just hit on a really important one, frankly. You talk about the environment. Now, I don't know what your position is if you think there is any type of climate crisis or glo- you know, unnatural global warming. But the fact is, in terms of what we have as courtroom quality evidence, this man is the first person on record to specifically detail the unnatural man-made climate change, unnatural global warming, damage to the ozone, and manifestations of that that would proceed forward from that first publication in 1951. So nobody prior to that, that's what we searched for too. Okay. Well, yeah. But so, so let's let's go back to ground basics. Sure. Like um, you know, if we had some aliens, you know, the most plausible thing is they would have been born like a hundred million years ago or like reached our level. So they would be really ancient. They would be enormously ancient and they would have vastly better abilities than us. They would just be very advanced, right? Mm-hmm. So that's just un- by the assumption, right? By the assumption that they're aliens, they, they come from a ways away. They, they wouldn't have appeared at the same time as us. They would be far more advanced and therefore they, they would have a lot of options. So if they wanted to tell us to be more environmentally friendly, they would have many ways to do that. You know, if, if they wanted to be really clear about it, they could have just been really obvious. So it is somewhat puzzling that they would choose this strategy of talking to this one old man in Switzerland and letting him take some pictures of them and having some interviews, but like not doing something bigger, more obvious. Okay, let me address that because you've hit on some very valid points. And that's why I remembered when you were talking about this ancient, you know, more ancient origin, the information, and this is where I say to people, just like you present something as a hypothesis, you can't prove it. I can't prove what I'm about to tell you, but this is the background information. And they published it long ago with him. They are a highly advanced space traveling human race whose ancestors originated millions of years ago in it's either Lyra or Lyra in the Vega system, a galaxy quite a distance from here. They became the kind of grabby aliens, if you will. Their ancestors did. They were very warlike. They had extremely high technology, obviously. They could travel extensively in space and often in time. And they went and they dominated and domineered. But there came a point in their development when a faction of that race chose to take a different path. And that faction went in two directions. It went to the star system of Sirius A and Sirius B, where, and we jump back 22 million years ago, which is a comfortable jump in this overall multi-millions of years, the the race uh, splinter group that settled there decided to pursue a more positive consciousness-related, or you could say spiritual path, develop the arts and all these wonderful things, and they genetically engineered out of themselves the fighting spirit. That attracted grabby aliens, if you will, who could appear being attracted to that opposite. And to make that long story short, they got about genetically modifying a race on their world to become very effective warriors and protectors of them until they could get themselves these elite highly developed types back into the reality of having a fighting spirit themselves. And when they was set done to their satisfaction, when they were already the race had protected them, they decided that because they had done two genetic modifications to this warrior race, one was to increase genetically the propensity for violence and aggression to be good fighters, and two, to drastically reduce the lifespan. This is all speculative, but I'm, you've got a hypothesis. So here's, here's a part of it, and there's a lot here. Okay, I'm not going to take you through all of it, but th- they migrated. There was a faction there that took a large so, number. So of- this just doesn't... So again, there's, there's two kinds of things we want in our analysis. One is sort of a prior analysis, how plausible is a hypothesis, and then we want evidence, what evidence is consistent with. But if we focus on the prior here, you know, first of all, 
you know, 20 million years ago is uncomfortably close in time to us in the sense that it's a five, you know, it's a four, we're 14 billion years after the origin of the universe. So uh, it would be puzzling if they had just appeared that close to us in time. So we would expect a, an older history. But even if it was only 20 million years ago, that's still plenty of time that if they had many different parts of their descendants, even if one part of them followed this path that you describe, all the rest of them would have just filled and changed the galaxy. So the fact that we look out in the galaxy is not all occupied and changed creates well, a puzzle for this hypothesis. What happened to everybody else? Okay. So first of all, their science says, no, our universe isn't 14 billion years old. It's 47 trillion years of age. And people say, well, how could that be? We don't see all the galaxies that should be there and all that stuff. And they said, well, it's pretty obvious. Matter simply uh, it expires. It has a duration. Things change. It goes to energy. Things reform. But that's, uh, I'm just saying that for, I will say to, the, to you this, on the speculative end, uh, end of things where we have hypotheses and theories and all this stuff, I can fill all those holes, but I will tell you this, the migrations that they claim and the visits that they claim that they, their ancestors and others have made to this world go back even before then. There have been comings and goings. There have been people stranded here when their technology failed. There are remnants or things that are very obvious about. The, I fear that you're like really focused on this one man's reports, et cetera, as your explanation for the universe. But there's just really a lot we know about the universe that doesn't come from this one man's reports. And those need to be integrated in. That is, we, we know a lot about cosmology. We know a lot about astrophysics, et cetera. And that, well, you know, it, it just isn't plausible. The universe is trillion years old. We, we do have pretty strong evidence about its age and, and what's out there. And, and from that, from the things we know, it is an important puzzle. Why haven't they filled things? So it's just well, not believable that they had lots of descendants and one particular descendant did this weird thing and, and none of the rest of them had any impact, right? So, so they, where are everybody else? They don't claim to be the only or the progenitors throughout the universe. They claim that there are multitudes of different races deep, far in the universe, very little here. There's nothing in our solar system. Right, but, but, but when we look in our galaxy, everywhere we look, it all looks pretty much dead and empty. That is, there isn't rearranging of stars, taking apart of things, making a big visible structures. That's the puzzle, is why we don't see a lot more change and you know use. So on Earth, when humans, you know, take a harbor or take farmland or whatever it is, we, we make changes to use things. We, we don't just leave it alone, right? We, if we, if we want to use something, we, we, we you know, dig it up and we reprocess it and we change it, right? And so that's the kind of thing you would expect to see in the universe if there were advanced life out there that could do those things and they didn't well, take but, this. Yeah, out. but the, the problem and the problem with any hypotheses if in the face of evidence that's court, let me give you an example of something. One quick experience I had of many. 2013, I'm in Las Vegas. There's a presentation at a UFO thing. I've got a table of stuff. A man comes over with his arms crossed. He's shaking his head from left to right. I say to him, sir, what do you do? I say, you have a problem here. He says, I'm a retired judge. May I step in your courtroom, Your Honor? Yes, how can I help you? You think this is a hoax? Yeah. I said, well, let me ask you something. If NASA claims, as they do, that they discovered that the reason for the contraction of the planet Mercury is the metal core, if they claim that they discovered it, but I say to you, my friend in Switzerland discovered it 32 years earlier, specifically that piece of information, would I have to prove it to you? Would I have to prove my hypothesis to you or my theory or my spe yes of course so i picked up the book that i had and i opened it and i said your honor do you see the copyright date yes i do and i went and i said now you see this one here yes do you see where this man mr meyer is asking this alleged extraterrestrial woman i've always been curious to know what the reason for the contraction of the surface okay. But, but let's, let's just stack. I mean, we're imagining amazingly advanced aliens, right? With amazing powers who could travel very long distances. They come all the way here 
in order to have a conversation where they tell somebody some astrophysics facts a few decades before other people know them. What's the point of that? What, what do they get out of that? What, no. what, does, what does anybody get out of telling sure. some people a few astrophysical facts a few decades in advance? No, 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 no. Surely wouldn't there be other things you'd want to say, other sorts well, of information to impart, yes. other sorts of ways to convince your, I mean, there'd well, be much easier ways to convince people that they were advanced but, than but, that, but, right? You, but there's a lot of assumptions you're making. I'm sorry, but I have to say it, Robin. You're assuming that they gave him a few astrophysical facts. That's pretty good, but they didn't give him a few. He, we have over 250 specific error-free examples in a variety of sciences that this man had no access to. That's pretty good. Right. Right? But why? Why would well, you do uh, that? Okay. Now, you said why, why that and why not something else? Because part of the history that they've relayed to him extensively they had forefathers who appeared here on earth thousands of years ago who represented themselves as the gods and creators and lorded it over, lorded it over primitive earth human beings who'd never seen a pencil or a flashlight, let alone this shield that appears to fly or a disc or a burning fly. And those beings, and we even have some of the names that won't make people happy to hear them, they said these people were long lived, they were powerful, they had advanced technologies, but they also set humankind on a very bad and illogical path that would they would base their existence on beliefs, on worship, on, on looking outside themselves for their own authority. If we come here, which we can, and we've made ourselves you know, you're not the only guys photographed our ships and you're not the only, we have, you know, made ourselves, we've downloaded to you. So we require the people of earth to think for themselves, not to simply create a hypothesis and think that that's the only defensible one. What if you're faced with, what if I come to you and I say, I've got hundreds of examples of information we didn't know before this man published them. You're going to you're, obviously you're, have to. You're not coming up with the next story for why this makes sense. That is, what's their goal such that this would be the most effective way to achieve that goal? That's the kind sure. of story we're looking for. He's not the first person that they contacted, according to them. The contacts go back to people whose names you will know, like Enoch, Elijah, and Isaiah. Okay, and but, yes. but what are they trying to do and why was this the best way to right. do it? Okay. It remains to be seen if it's the best way. That's arguable. Why is it? But even plausibly, because it doesn't look remotely like the best way, as far as I can see. So I I need it to be in the ballpark. Okay, I'm going to tell you why. Because as we go through this information, which obviously, you know, does uh, beg a lot of questions and, and, you know, you know, stretch credulity and all that for for people, one of the... (sighs) The important part that I latched on, for what I considered very important, was when I came upon not only this environmental stuff, which I was finding was published before, I start to find information warning about coming geopolitical events that are going to, if not intersected by human will and action and, and course correction, are going to result in a third world war involving specific countries that will destroy the United States of America. Right, right. But, but the point is, yes. if you have warning, if you're a big you know, alien civilization and you are ancient and very powerful and you have messages that you want to tell humanity, there's just a lot more obvious direct ways to do that than to chat with somebody in the Swiss Hills that he writes it down and you people years later try to analyze it, right? Wouldn't there be just much more direct ways to talk? Well, let's just say that, let's say there's much more direct ways, but let's just say this is the way they chose for whatever reasons to use. So do we say now that we take courtroom quality evidence of prior knowledge without error in hundreds of, I mean, I can do this all day standing on one leg. Do we take that do we say that we're going to subscribe to the nonsensical SETI model? They're going to talk to us in the language of mathematics, says Doug Vekar. That, that, I mean, again, there are many, in a courtroom, you have to not just present evidence. You need to present a story of what happened that makes sense. You have to show intent, uh, opportunity. Ah, you uh, got it. You know, so, Here we go. so you have to make a story that makes sense. It's not enough just to show a bunch of pieces if, if, if it doesn't make sense. Okay, you've landed on something that I'd forgotten I would tell you, and it's not terribly long. January 2017, 
uh, on a Saturday morning, I get a phone call. I don't know the voice. Guy says, I'm Joe. I'm an investigator. Are you Michael? Yeah, yeah. You want to talk to me about your Billy Meyer case? I said, sure. Why not? He said, because I think it's a hoax. Will you still talk to me? Three months. This guy, we don't have a conversation like you and I are having. He literally interrogates me about every single detail. He can, he, one after another, one after. He disappears. He comes back at the end of August. And he says, I'll tell you who I am. And this is what he says to me. He says, my name is Joe Tisk. I'm formerly the top investigator and supervisor for the United States Air Force Office of Special Investigation and the Department of Defense. I've personally vetted hundreds of people for the purpose of protecting our country. When I came upon this, it sounded like a screaming hoax to me. Uh, I deal with people who could have their fingers on the nuclear trigger and all that stuff. I researched everything you presented in the information website, and I did a total of eight-month investigation, and I will now tell you the following. This Billy Meyer UFO case is 100% authentic. I will take on any skeptics on your behalf. And he says, I am going to, I'm presenting to you an article you can post on your website that will march you or anybody through who doesn't have to know anything more than just following. I'm going to use means, motive, and opportunity. And I will show you or anybody that this is. Okay. So, yeah. so, I mean, now like what? I say, I think it's, not crazy to think that some UFOs are aliens, right? That that's my whole stick is to say, look, if we analyze the prior probability, that's not crazy as a hypothesis. And we do see a lot of evidence that people say is substantial. And I'm not an expert on that, but somebody ought to be looking at that and draw the conclusion. So let's tentatively for the moment of this conversation, believe that in fact, this is relatively strong evidence that in fact, like there are am amazing abilities and um, amazing sightings, right? Therefore, the sort of thing that is hard to explain with accidents or even hoaxes, if we don't believe this is a hoax, but that's mm -hmm. less clear. That is, he could just be lying or this other guy could be lying. So what do I know, right? But mm -hmm. nevertheless, it's in the ballpark of something we might consider the hypothesis that there really are aliens here. But the next step is to say, that doesn't mean you should believe everything they say to you, okay? We don't have just any because belief. they're real doesn't mean you believe them, right? We don't believe this. We that's the whole thing. I've never expressed, and they've never expressed a belief. But you hit on something that I think we should take out of the equation. Forget that, for the sake of what we consider the higher standard of proof. Forget the aliens. As I said, you can take the UFOs out of this. What do we do when we? We have people in think tanks and military intelligence. We have people who are futurists, the people at Future of Humanity, right. who are projecting and creating hypotheses. What do we do when we have specific geopolitical information, when we are told where an event will occur, or even in the case of an environment, where the, which five volcanoes are going to become active during this period of time? And it's, we know it's published long before, so, and it's not so, speculative. What do so, we do? So, there's a separate issue of if you have good sources of information, how should you help the world with that? So right. that's that's an issue completely separate from UFOs or sightings or anything. It's just what do you do when you think you know something that other people are skeptical about? And so that's an issue I've actually spent a lot of my life thinking about institutions for forecasting and helping. And one way to think about it might be betting markets. That is, if you could find a way to bet on these claims, then your bets would be things you'd make money on. And the world would be clued into these things via the betting market prices changing. So I, I would, you know, that's the first response I would say is to look for things that your forecast would have financial market price implications for, and then tra make trades based on those forecasts that you have, and you will make money and you will inform the rest of the world. That's the most reliable way I can imagine for you to get this information out in a situation where people are just not inclined to believe. We yeah. don't want anybody to believe anything. Um, you, you know, we, for a moment, just to go back to the whole thing about UFOs and you tell me how your time is. I don't want to you know, overdo it here, but when you look at the conversation going on at top levels of media about UFOs, all you have right now are blurry tic tac videos and a bunch of talking heads who have zero evidence. Now, you and I have spent a couple hours going back and forth over 
evidence. We can disagree, but you, you've never seen this evidence presented. Why would that be? Why would it be that the best evidence that could still be, for, with all the analyses that have been done on this by people from IBM, NASA, GBL, why isn't that being discussed? So, I mean, honestly, that's not, unfortunately, that hard for me to understand in the sense that, um, first of all, from a great many people's point of view, their prior probabilities are just that this couldn't be true, okay? That's so, a belief that they believe. Well, but, but they have a basis. There's a reasonable basis for that. That is all of the understandings that we have about the universe make this a implausible hypothesis. That is, I, I, so that's a one reason why they would be skeptical. And as you know, as you, you've said about the UFO world and all the world, there's just a lot of people out there who are pretty sloppy thinkers and they're really overly enthusiastic about stuff. And that's just a fact of the world. And that means people have to find a way to, you know, defend themselves against all of that. And one way they do that is just to sort of be pretty skeptical. So, so how, do they, the how do they deal with then when experts analyze something and say, these photographs are authentic. They're not hoax. We can't tell you if they came from outer space. But right, they, right. But, no. but so, somebody would have to sit and look at that testimony in order to judge whether it was believable. And that takes a lot of time and trouble. Does and it take more time and speaking. trouble than what the government is doing, jerking itself around? Remember, yes. I don't know if you remember this. When uh, this whole Tic Tac thing was announced, there's a guy named Lou Elizondo. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, and he comes forward with a threat situation now. Then they bring it, and the government says, we're appointing a committee to take six months to evaluate this. Now, look, if, so, so look, I uh, am a professor of economics. Right. Okay. I have a lot of ordinary credentials in terms of publications and things like that. But even I know that if I start to say things that seem a little odd, I will just lose my audiences. They will just stop listening. That's true for someone who even has a lot of credibility. So our world is just not a world where people have much of an incentive to listen to contrary positions and to go through their details. That's just the fact of our world. Right. So the question is how to, how to deal and respond to that, but it's not terribly puzzled. I don't need a conspiracy necessarily to explain why people might not be listening to you because it just it seems to me easy to understand from the context that is, you're asking people to look at a lot of detail, which they don't want to bother to do, which isn't transparent. It takes a lot of time and effort to, fix, to sort through it. And you're not giving, you know, your hypothesis from their point of view looks pretty unlikely. And in their view, you're also mixed up with a bunch of other people who are pretty sloppy and pretty overly overconfident. And those things all put together make people just back off from it and stay away from it, especially given that it's taboo. People make fun of it, right? There's just all these... Well, Overdetermined reasons why people would not pay attention. This is maybe the failings of people, but when you have one man whose job was to protect the security of the United States, who says this is authentic, here's how any one one art article, and he explains right. it. Take any of this and you think it through, and you will know this is authentic. You don't have to see every uh, photograph and every video. You don't but, have to read look, every. It, if you just go away from your field and go look at the history of lots of other fields, you will also see that when contrarians had an unusual point of view, even if it was later turned out to be true, it took a long time for them to get anybody to listen. And often, like the people, initial people who found it, they never got anybody to listen. And it was somebody else who got people to listen. Yeah, so, we, so if you just set aside your world, I think you'll just see that, in fact, our world has trouble, you know, assimilating information from unusual sources, especially when there's just a lot of people who, who want to believe things there. That's just the fact of our world. It's not about UFOs or anything in particular. That's just our larger world. Okay, but the failing in that argument is that in our world, in our country, we set up a government commission specifically to address this issue. Now, I'm not faulting you for-, for, for right, right, but that out. government commission has very limited time and energy. And there's all no. these people who want them to yeah. listen to them. So that they, they have to make a lot of choices and they do. Okay. What I'm saying to you is, I understand your arguments about it. And I understand, I don't disagree with your worldview. I would say it's rather tragic that it's accurate to such a high degree. As these people have said, we are now- uh, in 1975, they told this man, 
after 2020, the U.S. superpower will cease to exist as a superpower. The United States of America is going to have two coming uh, massive civil wars. Country will break so, up. Into territory. Look, look I'm, I'm a professional economist. Sure. And I'm part of the economics community. And it's just a fact that policy of nations like the U.S. simply ignores a lot of well-established economics. And that's true of most places. So you don't have to go as far as contrary UFO hypotheses to talk, look at things that are ignored. It's basically a fact that standard government policy ignores widely accepted, well-established things by large academic disciplines. That's the world we live in, yes, where we ignore big, important things that lots of people know. Right. But here's it. I mean, I'm saying this with all due respect. We're just two people talking. You're somebody who writes books and has hypotheses about things based on certain information, but they're hypotheses. You can't walk into a courtroom and present evidence. You can say, well, this is our best hypothesis is a reasoning based on a priori situation, blah, blah, blah. And then I walk into the courtroom and I say, well, Your Honor, I have 617 independently analyzed UFO photos that experts from NASA, JPL, IBM, McDonnell, Douglas, et cetera, including scientists who've shared my stage, have said these are authentic. But, but, but you think there's a courtroom that will listen to that sort of evidence? Only if we were lucky enough to get sued and have to bring it in. But, but, there, but there isn't. That, that, so, that's a key sad fact about our world. So, you can, you can have evidence about a claim and there just aren't people willing to listen to your evidence. That's There is no courtroom set up to listen to that. It's, that doesn't mean that the evidence isn't exactly. No, no, but the point is there isn't a process by which you can bring the evidence and have people look okay. at it and be convinced. That's so now I'll tell you the process that I think, and one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you, and I love speaking with you, really, as bizarre as this may seem to you and as you know, frustrating, you are in touch with people like Lex uh, Fridman, who seem sure. to subscribe to the theory that he didn't need to even open the email and other thinkers at Oxford and other places. So I'm going to say this to you because you're the first person who had the uh, decency, if you will, to entertain what, whatever you may think of it. And I'm not somebody who's saying to you, I see UFOs and therefore they're real. I've, I, you know, four hour presentations on evidence. I've done it many times. So I'm saying the people that you are in touch with who are concerned about the future of humanity, who basically are still trying to figure it out based on theories and, and hypotheses. I'm going to ask somebody if uh, I'm asking you to even ask Lex or any of these other people, and you can tell me that they won't look because they're too busy, but I'm going to ask you for the sake of what I see is the future. So here's what I would ask you to do. Sure. I would say, there are standard ways in which academics um, would take the sort of evidence you have and create what we call a data set, mm -hmm. a structured set of data where the items are all of the same form and therefore can be formally analyzed as a unit. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have formal standard ways to look for statistical significance of hypotheses within such data sets. And you, it doesn't look like you have turned your many anecdotes into a data set. And that would be the key thing to get people to pay attention. You would say, you know, there's, you know, hundreds of documents and, and hundreds of pictures, et cetera. But you, you basically will point to a particular document or a particular picture and say, let me tell you the story of this. And the problem is academia isn't very well set up to take in a hundred stories like that. What we're set up for is taking a data set, a mm -hmm. formal data set, where we have a bunch of data items all organized together in a structured way. And then we have ways to analyze those data sets to see if we see a significant pattern. So and that's a feasible thing for you and your associates to do, is to take these, say, examples of IO moons or volcanoes or whatever it is, make it into a data set, make it into a structured thing where each item is of the same form, where the numbers are in the same style, produced in the same way, and where it's systematic. That is, you don't select the 100 most interesting cases. You kind of systematically go through and do all cases that meet some criteria. And then, mm -hmm. then we might more trust that when we did an analysis, we will get something interesting. That is, if we thought, so you pick the 50 cases that best fit your, your case, and we had a data set like that, we, we couldn't analyze it in the standard way we would because we think, oh, no, these are very selected data. They aren't random sample. They are 
chosen by this criteria, that's the key thing that's at issue. So, that, so what you'd want to do is pick a way to define cases of interest that was independent of you know, whether they're going to support your case or not, and then make a data set where, they, where you're organizing those cases and presenting them again in a structured form Right. such that we can do statistics and we can I, do statistics, then we might be able to show that you really have a big statistical anomaly here. By cases, do you mean other UFA or stuff? No, no, I, I mean like, you know, categories. So, no, take the example of the IO volcano, right? right. Or the mercury core. Right. Uh, those are two examples you gave, right? Yeah. Well, so those are examples of a category of cases right. where mm -hmm. this person made a claim about some astrophysical fact or something, right? Mm -hmm. So make a data set of those cases. The cases are the times when he said, uh, you know, a particular claim where he reported a claim mm -hmm. on a date about a thing. We have that, yeah. yeah. But but you don't have it as a data set is what I'm saying. I have, you, you know, formally made it a data set. Look, yeah, the closest thing we have right now is a page with 150 of these specific examples that you're speaking about. And we could put it together probably. Right, but but are those examples selected by what criteria from a larger set? That's the key question. It's uh, one of the key questions. It, well, they are advanced. Uh, in other words, what we see is specific uh, examples of advanced knowledge of subsequently corroborated. Right, scientific but, but what I would instead ask you is to go through and have a systematic procedure where you generate those things according to a criteria of any claim about astrophysics not just claims that were somehow verified later, all claims. That is- We don't have any erroneous information to date. Now, it maybe- it Then your data set won't have that, but again, have correct. a systematic process. Right. So Bruce. to ask you further on that, should we organize it by virtue of uh, astronomical, environmental, geopolitical, medical? So the, those the, categories are there. The main thing would be to have a process by which you picked them that- wasn't correlated with these answers that you're trying to prove. That, that's the key thing. That is, oh, what do you mean? Oh, well, just like any, for example, just take any time there was a claim made about something astrophysical, right? Yeah. And just collect all of those. That's what we've done. Now, the problem and, and then organize is, them. Yeah, that's, yeah, we can do that. Okay, but the one the problem, of the key things is what, what we want a data set like that is we want to know at the time this claim was made what was the astrophysical consensus on that topic? And that's going to take a lot more work to generate. I think that, that by um, we the way we did it was by searching for the information on the topic and looking for the earliest publication, official publication by scientific sources on the topic. So when we found them, we called that corroborated because they were always after his publication. He didn't publish things later on, didn't publish things that had already been confirmed and discovered. They only, or the alleged source, right. or he, only right. published but, information so, that says so, this is so about I, this. I yeah. still think, you know, it's it's a tough battle here to try to convince people. You're basically trying to convince people that Sky was, in effect, a prophet. That is, he could foresee things that other people didn't see at a time via this extra source. And no. that's a that's a tough claim. That it, it it's going to be hard to persuade. It isn't that. It's to find out whether or not something, as we said in the very beginning, is factually accurate and true. Fact, true facts. Is this true? That and here's where we supersede. And I think it's a good idea. I, I'll work with friends to pull something together like that. But there's two things to say about it. One, we could we could say that in a sense you're looking at a you, you want to have a peer review or something. They will, in my estimation. If you compare a peer review to a copyright, you can forget peer reviews for a very simple reason. Peer reviews change. People change opinions. They, they can be wrong. Copyrights aren't wrong. The so, information so let's go all the way back to basics. There's yeah. two, two things you could be trying to do here. One is you could be just trying to convince us that, you know, some UFOs are aliens or some UFOs are very advanced powers. That's one thing you could be trying to convince us by saying, among the evidence, this is especially strong and it's hard, you know, especially hard to explain another way. So that's one agenda you could have is just to try to convince us there really are, you know, an amazing sightings. Another thing you'd be trying to convince us to do is to follow the, rec you know, to listen to the advice of this source about current events and what's mm -hmm. likely to be happening soon. Mm -hmm. That second thing is just a much harder ask. It's going to be much harder for you to do. And 
you can just achieve that again directly by doing bets. If you if you had a financial, that no, is, no. if, if you know when business. wars will happen, if you know when things will happen, then you can make financial bets that that bet on those things and inform us by ma- and making money at the same time. How do you feel about a coming global financial crash? Do you think there's one coming? Well, do you know when? Um, uh, well, I would so, say- So that's a matter of how specific is the purported information, right? Sure. If you could tell me exactly what day it was going to be on, well, that would be different than just saying sometime in the next decade, there's going to be a crash. Because you know what? Every 10 years, there's a crash. That's sure. not really information. Okay. So here's my, my other perspective my perspective. One, I think your data set idea is a good idea. But two, I think what we have had demonstrated to us where the the failings, if you will, of certain kinds of, of science, pro, scientific approaches, let's pull it together and start it out, has been demonstrated by the, a man who's tasked with protecting the lives of 300 million people. He's not going to go on a hypothesis. He's not going to have a six month, com- well, this is very important. If he didn't exist, if his information didn't exist, then any and everything else. And because I, I don't care about the ETs. I don't care about the UFOs. We have it. But right now, we're far past the point of that being even able to get into the conversation because all of the, the, that game is rigged. We don't care. I, if we can prove to you that Switzerland's recent renunciation of its neutrality, its effective renunciation of its neutrality through its dealings with NATO and the EU is in a book already from 2004, along with every the attacks that are coming to Sweden and Finland and Norway because of their, I mean, I had a so guy. If you know what, what, you know, major world events are happening soon, then there are financial market trades you can make to profit from that. And those trades will inform the world about those events. And in addition, you can get betting markets to make new claims where you can ask them to make a bet on the, your claim and then you can bet on it. So there's, right. there, that's by far the most obvious way that you could get the world to listen to this information. Otherwise, the world's really pretty much going to ignore it. I just don't think you're going to succeed in getting them to believe <laughs> no, I, I, that this I, one guy really knew a lot about world events. Right. Again, just for clarification, by the way, thank you for being so patient to reiterate things and to make your, your position and your points very clear. Um, let's just say we have a different perspective because on the timeline that we're looking at, uh, we would say that just people trying to make money off of the thing. And then somebody said, well, it's a lucky bet. That isn't, it isn't of our concern or the concern of the people involved who are the source, however they would be. We published advanced information specifics and sent them throughout the state and the country and the world on COVID. Everything has proved to be true. And yet we have one doctor in New York who had an Al Jazeera interview he went on before these events all fulfilled. He said, my source tells me this, Al Jazeera, they were blown away, everything came true. So you could, you could just take that as an example of here's medical information represented by a frontlines doctor. But, but gets what, what, what you seem to want is the world to stamp true on your forehead and say, no. these people are true, but that doesn't work. So if you want the information to get out, there's other channels. So the betting market channel the financial market sure. is the best channel I can figure for you to get this information out. Otherwise, it just won't be. That, that's more, that's more all there is st- to it. More than stamping on my forehead, we just wish that people, uh, because there are people that are doing an abundant amount of outreach, but it's pretty well stopped. And we only wish that people would take the information and vet it for themselves and not worry about experts. That is, is a high standard. That's really hard to get people to do. Sorry. Most people are just not willing to do that, that degree of investigation of somebody's source. It's we know hard. that is, but you see, there are thinkers like you, there's thinkers like Lex Fridman, there's thinkers like other people who are involved right. in looking but, at the But future. here's how the key world works, right? We specialize in things. Right. And then each right. of us says, I'm willing to investigate claims in my area of specialty, but if it's not my area of specialty, I say somebody else ought to be looking at that. It's not me because we sure. can't all do everything. And the thing right. you're asking me to look at here is I say, that's just not my specialty. It's like, right. I can talk to you about the priors and the larger consequences. The details of this evidence is just not my specialty. I haven't invested in learning how to judge those things, how to look at those details, what the relevant things to look at. That takes years. You should take years to learn to get be good at that. 
the people who have spent years getting good at that, they should look at it, but not me. Right. I'm not an expert on that. So the specialization thing, I, I have often thought about this. Let's say you've got a, um, oh, I don't know, a salesman. He specializes in selling some product and he's right. walking through his neighborhood late at night, sparse neighborhood, the houses set apart. And he notices one of the houses on, is there's a fire in the basement. Now, if he's not a specialist and if he's not a fireman and the, he's close to that house, while maybe he's got his phone, he's going to go pound on that door and yell fire. If he's a specialist, he's going to go, that's not my category. Is that my job? And he'll walk on. And that's what he should do is he should point it out to the specialist, right? He should call the fire department or. Yeah, but what if he doesn't No, the first thing he should be doing, whether it's phone in hand or not, is running towards that house and screaming at the top of his lungs. Right. But but that's not analogous here. So like this is not an immediate emergency situation. Well, maybe that's not accurate. Maybe that's not accurate, because if things are as has been long portrayed in this information it is an emergency now does an emergency mean next week a year from now something tomorrow but i let's i i leave it with with real consideration for your perspective i do and i will also you know say to you and i'm sure you can understand uh, even though you're in another you know field of uh, specialization that as somebody dealing with evidence who has uh you you know approached this in a certain way and approached as many people as it could, actually none of them, so far, I'll be honest with you, none of them have asked even for that kind of subset of stuff and all the rest of it. You've got a, you know, Avi Loeb, we could talk about him. with. I talked to him briefly one day on the phone. He wanted me to send him the information. As soon as I sent it to him, he wouldn't answer the phone. We've had that happen over and over. But anyhow, he's he's solving his face. It's been fun talking to you. I I think like if we had another conversation, the, the larger issue, I think, of interest I think it's just a very interesting question. What happens when there are contrarians out there who say, I have information the world should listen to. How does the world organize to deal with that? We, we, I don't think we're doing a very good job, but we could ask, how could we do better? But that's, that's abstracted away from your particular evidence, from the more general question of just how can we do better at dealing with that sort of situation? Because it looks like we well, should do something different. I, I would say that's an interesting conversation, but with the, the seriousness that I have about the content and intent of the information, a generalized conversation uh, about form and approach and all isn't relevant. I take from you the data set thing, I think, is a good thing. We, we've tried, we could do a better job probably, but we feel that. Um, in your field, even with scientists and people, even if you said, hey, I saw, had this screwy conversation with this little guy, I'd appreciate it because you never know who might add something unto that conversation, a perspective, a recommendation, who might want to take a look, who knows, who's interested even in the UFO part, least important, the alien part, and, and or the information. So with all that well, being said- thank you for inviting me on your podcast. Absolutely. So we will both go on with the rest of our day. We will. Robin, thank you very much. Take care. Bye. Bye.